So evangelizing your children. You know, we're wrapping up the evangelism talk, kind of this, this summer-long series on evangelism. And we, we pivoted to evangelizing children because this is really speaking to a lot of who our congregation's made up of. And not to throw singles aside or the grandparents aside or those who have never had kids aside. That's not it at all. I hope that even through this talk of parenting, you can come to see that the principles we talk about are for the Christian, period. It's not, well, I've got kids and so I need to be about living biblically. No, it's about living biblically in all of your life. And when God blesses you with children, it's a natural, I'm going to bring them with me as we go to the mountain of the Lord, as we ascend the hill of the Lord to worship God. I'm bringing my children, right? This is not right and good. And so, um, though a lot of the application will be focused to parents in the room that are having their kids sit with them through the service or raising them day in and day out through family worship and things like that, um, I want to just tell you on the outset, you know, this isn't just for the parents. This is, this, the biblical principles will be for everyone. And I want to give a shout out to the, the dudes in the front. I think there's a lot of these Harden Simmons football players. Yeah, come on. Um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can relate a little bit. I, I played some ball at Harden Simmons for a couple years, so that was fun. Uh, so injuries held me back, and I just got burned out. So if you're there, like, I can commiserate. Come on now. Come on. Um, it is. It is what it is. But it was a great time. Uh, a lot of my discipleship in college happened uh, in those formidable years. I found Southside sophomore year of college um, after my spring season, or um, sophomore year, sophomore season. So anyway, um, and then just the Lord took me to new heights and, and new depths in his word. And so plug in. I know you feel like, man, I'm so busy with, with I mean, full-time sport at, and even at a D3 school, like it's, it's full-time. Um, dive in, right? And, and don't, uh, don't be on the sideline, all right? Dive right in, jump in the game. All right, so I want to give you the big picture. I want to give biblical principles, okay? And the first few big principles we got to consider today uh, is really the glaring one of why talk about evangelizing children, why talk about parenting in the pew. And really, if you distilled it all down, it comes and funnels into this idea that the worship of God, right, the worship of Yahweh uh, is to be a whole life endeavor. It's a whole life mentality. That worship is not just a thing we do on a Sunday morning, and it's not just something we do on a Wednesday night, right? God has created us to be worshipers, and what we do is worship. And though our worship is distorted by sin, right, it is no less true that we are created to worship, and that if we aren't trained in how to worship biblically, we'll miss the mark. Right? If we're not given the truth of God and his word, if we're not revealed, if it had not been revealed to us who this God is and how we should worship him, we'd miss the mark. All throughout scripture, people after people are missing the mark. They're, they're worshiping God incorrectly. A lot of Israel's judgment was because they didn't worship God rightly, right? And so you can walk through the scriptures and see that is a huge principle of how we should order it our life, is the worship of Yahweh is a whole life mentality. And the second big principle under that is we have a biblical mandate to train our children in the Lord. And when I say in the Lord, I mean in the worship of Yahweh, right? We have a biblical mandate to train our children when God gives us children to train them in the Lord. And this is true for your grandkids as well. And so there is no, well, God gave me kids and I need to worship God, but they'll just, they'll figure it out. Or I'll send them to church and just pray that it sticks. But we have a mandate and we can't abdicate it. We can't pawn it off. Um, and there is no wiggle room for you as a parent. God has given you the responsibility to train your child. Okay? And so I think it's imperative that we have some wisdom. We have some principles to go along with this. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot. Okay? And fathers, as a side note, play a primary role in training your children. Okay. We are unapologetically a complementarian church, and we can disseminate that later on and talk about what that really means. But it stresses the need for a father in the home and the need for the father to be a strong spiritual leader. And so the call is men rise up. Men have courage 
to lead your family. And it's not, you got to lead them perfectly with a seminary degree and a tie up here and let's get on the couch, kids, and everybody has their literature, you know, liturgy down. This is, this is raw, it's, it's unfiltered, it's, it's real, and it's worship that's already inside of you coming out to lead your family, okay? So we're going to talk about that. So training children is a must. Third thing, the family is God's primary building block, all right, uh, of, of this world, okay? So you can look at this through a lot of different lenses, sociologically, theologically, but the family is what God has chosen to use in this world to bless and to bless the nations, right? He called Abraham, but he didn't just call him as an individual, right? He called him as a family to be a family and to be the father of many nations and to be the father of the faith that would bless the nations. And so families, strong families are critical, right? You're not a random collection of individuals that God just threw together and says, go individually serve me, but you're given family, you're given ties to others. And I know we all come from different backgrounds and families, but it's true that we, we have this innate and in, in this responsibility uh, to, to build strong families that then go out and bless the world, okay? Strong families make strong churches, which make strong communities, which make strong states and nations to the glory of God. And so, we at Southside are really passionate about you being a strong family, about whatever that looks like for you, single parents or two parents or one kid or 10 kids, it doesn't matter. We want you to be a strong family, and that comes with understanding the principles found in God's word. Okay, so worship is what we do, right? Principle number one, worship is what we do, right? All throughout scripture, we can see that God has created us to worship, and we are given uh, this privilege of worshiping Yahweh, right? Who was Abraham but this moon worshiper from the land of the Chaldeans, right? The land of Ur. God called him out graciously and gave him this, this, this revelation of who he was so that he may be worshiped, right? And we can see that thread traced all throughout Scripture. But our worship has to be informed by the gospel and our instruction comes from God's word, Right? We can see this in many different scriptures. I mean, I can go through a hundred of them, but the Psalms speak to the worship of God in a way that few other scriptures do. So let me just read a few, right? And you'll get a flavor of how we are to worship and come into the, the place where God has asked us to worship together, how we are to worship in our private lives, in our corporate lives, okay? This is the God we worship. Psalm 113 says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 115 says, not to us, O Lord, but to your name we give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalms 135 Psalms 134, come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Psalm 135, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. On and on and on the Psalms go again and again and again, beckoning the people of God to worship the Lord. And you'll see that just as Psalms 34 or 134 pointed out, what our worship does is it blesses the Lord, right? I think we'd often miss this in our corporate time of worship, our, in, our, in our worship period. What, what is it for? Why do we gather into this room? Why do we sing these songs and listen to the word of God preached? Is it for ourselves? Is it primarily? So that, man, we can feel really good this week. Okay, I'm not going to say we don't feel good when we leave this place. That's a derivative, but that's not the purpose, right? What's the point of our worship? It's to bless God. It's because God is the maker of heaven and earth, right? Because God is the one who's created us, who's given us life in our very beings, who's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. So we praise God. 
And when we lift up our praise and we lay down offerings of praise and adoration and glory and we say with our whole heart, God, you are enough. You are all we need, right? God smiles. This pleases the Lord. This blesses the Lord. So primarily, we have to view worship, right, not as a means to an end of ourself. I I need to be filled up. You know, I really just, my tank is empty. I just need to be filled. Praise God that he fills us. But we come and we approach worship to the most high God in awe and reverence, in expectancy, in wanting to give him everything, continually be poured out. Lord, take my very life if it be useful for you. Right? Everything I have is, a, is yours. So this is the posture of a people that are bought by the free grace of God who give freely everything they have to the Lord. And that's our worship, right? Romans 12, 1 says this very thing, right? That your spiritual act of worship is the giving of your whole life. We can flip there. I can hear the pages turning. Let's just do it. Let's don't talk about it. Do it. Romans 12, 1. This, is a, this should be a life verse, a key text for you as a Christian. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Those are all worshipful things, right? You're presenting your body. It's a living sacrifice. If you were a Jewish hearer of that letter, you would exactly know what they're talking about. This is all worship, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Right? So your whole life should be oriented around the worship of God. And, that's, and I'm speaking to you as an individual, as you as a, as a believer at this point, right? And, but it's natural that when the Lord blesses us and we grow as a family, right, the Lord gives you a wife. And as you join in your union, um, Habakkuk 2.14 says, what was the purpose of their union but to have godly offspring? And you begin to experience, right, the, the blessings of God through offspring. And it's not that that's the only way God blesses you, right? If you haven't had that opportunity or if that's not been the providence God has put in your life to have biological offspring, there are still ways that God is blessing you. He's blessing you with a church, blessing you with many kids to know and have spiritual children, right? Blessing you with the abundance of adoption and and fostering opportunities. And so I want to say that with a caveat, right? But primarily when the Lord blesses the union of a man and a wife, he gives you children and those children are to be ushered in, right? When, when your whole life is centered around the worship of God and everything is for the Lord and I'm going to bless the Lord when I come in here, when he gives you children, it's only natural that we want to grab them by the hand and say, Look, come worship this God who has found me, who has saved me, who has given me my very life and blessed me with you. It's only natural. We're going to want to push them to see this God who we serve. And many of the Psalms, again, speak to this reality. Psalms 8, I won't go through them all, I don't have time. Psalms 78, Psalms 24, 4 and 5, right? It's again reinforcing God's pattern that this is a family-oriented deal. So we have the privilege of ushering our children with us to meet this God whom we love. The God whom we will all give an account to, right? Right? Amen? Like, you're not going to present, you're not going to go before the Lord empty-handed. You're going to have everything you did in your life, and this is what I did with the life. And the thing that, will, that won't come out of your mouth is, Lord, I didn't have time to actually turn around and train my child to know you. I didn't have time. I worked a really busy job. The job you gave me, Lord, I it was just it was really demanding, right? None of us will... will We'll think, oh, that will be a good, I'll just say that, and that'll be good, right? And God will be like, you know what? I hadn't thought of that one. That was good. You're off the hook, right? We have to go to the Word of God and say, what does it say? What does God's Word say? Well, it says we're to train up our children. Ephesians uh, 6, 4. Fathers, highlight this in your Bible, right? It says, fathers, bring up your children. Train up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, Right? And that verse has more packed in it than a lot of verses in the Bible because it's not only addressing you as a father, right, but as, a, as, a, as one who is the head of the family and your job to train up your children uh, 
in the fear, in the discipline, in the instruction, in the reverence of God uh, is, is an integral calling of your life, right? It's, it's, it's part of who you are as a Christian. And so we need to be trying to ask God, how do I do this well? Okay, I'm going to skip down a few, a few things because I want to I wanna leave time. After I get done speaking, we're going to have a panel of some parents up here to just talk back and forth of some practical things and how this is done well, okay? So we know that the corporate worship setting is not lost on us. Something special happens when we gather here as the, as the people of God, right? We commune with God in a different way than we commune with him on a personal level every day of the week. And I'm only saying that because... Uh, the gathered church of God is the thing that Christ died for, right? He died for you, yes and amen, and, he, and he, he shed his blood that you would be forgiven, but not as a means to an end, right? It's so that you can be into the people of God. You can be grafted in as a wild olive branch into the main olive tree of God, right? This is the whole picture uh, that, that Christ is saying. So you've been bought into a people. And so when we gather together, something special happens. The risen Lord communes with us. He he walks through the aisles. He's convicting each one of us individually through the preaching of his word. He's, he's ministering to us, and, and it's a witness when we gather together and worship in this place. It's a witness to the world, and we want our children to experience that, right? And they do this in a number of ways, and so I'm going to jump into a few practical things, right? The other, the other principle, right, that we've that I mentioned is that we need to train our children on how to worship. We have to be trained how to worship. We come to God to understand who he is so that we can worship him rightly. And we need to train our children how to worship. And they won't get it without discipleship, without being led, without being taught and being shown. And so a big part of our heart here at Southside is when we gather together and we ask you, bring the children, right? And we get a lot of feedback that, wow, we, we accept kids really early kindergarten, four years old, that's really early to bring your kids. And we want to just smile at that and say, yeah, it's awesome. Because at that age, they are seeing things play out and they, they're, they're picking up cues. They're understanding what, what makes mom and dad tick. And they may not be able to articulate any of that, but it's formative things that are happening in your kid's life, deeper than what we can even probably articulate. So we're not, we're not saying your kids need to be like ducks in a row and like the Von Trapp family all in descending order of height and, and all your kids' hairs comb perfectly. That's not the goal when we say bring kids into here and, you know, have them worship, all right? Our goal is that they would be trained up actively in the pew on how to rightly worship the God who saved us. And so that happens a lot through just constant routine and repetition. Uh, children learn well through these routines and repetitions. So you'll see that what we do on a Sunday morning has some repetition, and that's intentional, right? We have a call to worship every Sunday, right? You can train your child to be expecting the call to worship. Okay, here comes the guy. He's going to call us to worship. Let's listen to see what God has to say to us in his word. To, let's listen. Maybe you pick out a word that you didn't know. It's a call to worship. We have corporate singing, Right? We have praise and adoration, then we have a pastoral prayer, then we have the sermon, the word of God preached, followed by more singing, and then a benediction at the end. Right? And at the end of every scripture reading, we say, this is the word of the Lord. What kid can't learn that, right? right? Even, your, even your smallest children will be able to memorize these things and say them wholeheartedly and enthusiastically in the worship center, right? That you would say, this is the word of the Lord, and we say, thanks be to God. You're training up your children to remember that what we do here is not just fragmented, like let's just, let's just see what works today, but it's routine and it's purposeful. So that's, that's called a liturgy, and we do it intentionally, Right? And so be thinking about how you can in, bring your kids into some anticipation of the worship service, all right? So that we're going to talk a little bit about that in our q and I, I think one, one, big print, one big help for parents that are like, okay, I'm with you, Stephen. I'm worshiping God all, in all of life. My corporate, uh, my private worship is I'm pouring out to the Lord. I'm reading his word. My corporate worship, I can't wait to get with the saints at Southside, um, you know, it's been said before, I've read it in a book, I can't remember which one, but there's three spheres of worship, right? There's your 
private, corporate, and family worship. And all three need to be working harmoniously together, right? If your private worship's non-existent, you won't have family worship and you won't have right corporate worship, right? And vice versa. Everything needs to be working together. So one thing this morning is ask yourself, ask the Lord, Lord, where am I worshiping you correctly? Where am I not worshiping you rightly? Is my private worship actually worship to you or am I just ticking a box, right? Is my corporate worship actually worship to you and for you and through you or am I just checking the box, being the smiley face so that no one asks the hard questions, right? Family worship is the same way. So if you're a father, lead your kids and your wife in worship together to the God who made you regularly, right? And so as you come into this corporate setting, having done private worship and family worship to some degree, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's genuine, right? it's not perfect, but it's genuine, and you come in here, this is just one extra layer. This is, ah, I get to do this with my family. And we get to build some anticipation in, through the week into, uh, into the worship service, right? One thing I love, and I've tried to tell my kids a lot, uh, that that worship on a Sunday morning is a get to, not a got to, right? It's a, it's a privilege. We get to go to church. We try to use that language a lot in our home. It's a get to, and we try to build some excitement, anticipation. And for a five-year-old, it's really hard to get them excited about the things that we do here sometimes. And that's okay, right? Again, it's repetition. It's routine. It's reinforcement. It's continuing to tell them what they need to know and what they should know and pray and hope the Holy Spirit gives them that ability to see that this is what they love to know. They, they know this now and they are enjoying it with us. And so all that happens uh, throughout the week, right? As we approach a Sunday morning, I'll just encourage you, live life from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. Don't, don't let your life be just on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, and that's the only time we engage worship with God. Right? I think y'all all know that to some degree, but it bears repeating. Make this a daily thing in your home where you're engaging with the Word of God, you're engaging in prayer, you're having some semblance of a family worship. And it doesn't have to be you know, morning and evening and 30 minutes and you know, this whole thing. It just needs to be something that you are doing or attempting to do right, to, to bring God into your everyday life, right, he's there already, we don't want to just play at being a Christian, we want to be Christians, and we want to be Christians every day, all right, here's some, here's some things I think will be helpful, and, and if you have, like, if these, are, if I go too fast, we have a, a one sheet on the welcome tables right here, that it's eight tips for how to Lead your family in corporate worship. Eight tips for having your children in the pews with you in the, in the seats. So grab one of those and read through those, and they're super helpful. Super helpful on how to think biblically about how do I, how do I get my kids ready for the Sunday morning. And it, they're also in here. And so this family worship guide or families together in worship guide. Okay, so first thing is let your Sunday morning start on sun, Saturday night. We've said that a lot, Right? Build anticipation for the Sunday morning, but also give them those cues like, hey, tomorrow morning we're going to get up, here's your clothes, we're going to have these, this is the routine, this is what we're going to do. Prepare them ahead of time and it'll make things go smoother, right? It's Sunday morning's always the most hectic time in our house. And I am not immune to that. It happens to me too. Even with some Saturday night prepping. Uh, last, this last night, Saturday night, was an exception. We were out later than usual. Uh, but we've built the routine and the expectation that Sunday morning we all get up at this, at this time and clothes are laid out. And so it was just expected this morning, even though they went to bed late, they just knew, okay, my clothes are here. And yeah, I'm, I'm a little more tired. It might be a little more energy to have to coax my kids to get up out of bed. And, but there's been some routine already built in, right? So it makes those nights that are a little off feel not so off. All right. So I won't, I won't belabor that too much. But I think it's important that as we ask you to bring kids into the worship service, and I'll, I'll say this again, it, we're not trying to set the bar so high that you can't attain to some standard, right? We're not here holding this standard bar up that you have to have your kids perfectly still and that everything is just pristine in the worship service. Far from it. We know and we expect children are going to wiggle around and need training. That's, that's the whole point. 
They come in at four and five years old and they're not going to be ready to sit through an entire service. Not right away. And that's why it's okay to train them. It's okay to be actively training them in the service. Oh, hey, we got to put that down. We're going to listen. Okay, hey, well, now we have to stand and sing. We get to do this. Let's sing to God. Cueing them again and again. Uh, this is why Taylor puts the songs out in the week ahead of time. So you can be singing these songs through the week so that when you come, your kids kind of hear, oh, I know that song. And they can mouth along or sing along and, and be engaged in the worship service. So we're not trying to say this is uh, idealistic. We, we are very realistic with how this goes in our service, but we want you to know that it's purposeful. Because again, what am I training my kid to do? I'm not training them to sit still. Right? That happens. What I'm trying to train them to do is to worship the God who made them. Right? I'm trying to train them to sit and to be in awe of this God who's created them, who's created all things. Their whole life and their whole purpose is for the glory of God. So if we reorient ourselves to that and say, well, it's not a, it's not, the, the sitting still will come when they learn to worship, right? When they learn to actually engage with their heart and understand the God who made them, the, the reverence will come and it'll continue to come and you'll just, we'll, we'll see small increments of growth, right? So it doesn't happen overnight, it's small. Okay, I had some things I wanted to read from these books and you know, I just don't have time and that's okay. I'm long-winded sometimes. Okay. Let me, um, let me go ahead and invite um, the Bowens up and the Maronis up. I've asked them, uh, Jackson and Samuel are two of our elders, and I've just asked them to come up. And we're going to discuss a little bit about what training children in the worship service is like, training children in the home, the importance of family worship. And I hope having some variability of, of voices really helps a lot of this stick. Thanks. Thank y'all so much. And uh, y'all will have, uh, y'all can share these mics. We need to be able to hear your voice. You got one? Okay, well, Maroni's Bones, thank you so much. I hope all this made sense. I kind of feel like it was, whew, it was we were shot out of cannon this morning, but what I um, what I want to what I want to touch on is maybe what I talked on a little bit. How does how does knowing and Jackson and Becky y'all can start? Uh, how does knowing what worship is like what it really is for? How does that inform and affect our participation in it? Right? Is this what what's what's the difference in knowing what worship is for the glory of God versus thinking of worship as we're going to sing songs and, and check a box. Yep. How does that inform uh, it? For, first of all, thank you. You're doing a great job of you know, oh. focusing uh, our church uh, on our, our, our children and, and the importance of parenting. Um, and you know, it's very humbling. When we got your email or your call about this, our first reaction was, no way. I mean, we, we've done nothing special or important. And I think it's important for us to remember that um, what, what, what we've heard throughout this entire series of evangelism that ultimately uh, the outcome is the Lord's. Uh, and so there is absolutely nothing that Becky and I have done that we can take credit for. We give the glory to God and we uh, thank him daily that our, our children know the Lord and they walk with him and we're seeing that in our grandchildren. But ultimately that is something we have to get to the Lord. We, we know parents who have done everything we've done in the in way of discipling their kids uh, and more and the outcome has been different. So that, that's very sobering, just reminds us that, you know, God is sovereign and, and, and God saves our kids. But to your question, you know, we've been thinking about uh, this week, you know, how do we teach our kids to worship? And honestly, I think it goes back to um, Exodus 2012, you know, honor your father and mother. You know, when we come into this place, it's all about surrendering our will to the father. And so when we look at these little ones, Worship starts with surrendering their will to mom and dad, uh, honestly. It starts with parenting. And, you know, parenting has been in the DNA of this church for 30 years. You know, Becky and I were blessed. To, there was somebody in a role just like yours that organized parent training. Uh, and back then it was Gary and Anne Marie Ezzo. Any Gary and Anne Marie Ezzo fans out there? I mean, that was a long time ago. But they were it when it came to, um, you know, parent training for, for Christian parents. 
And we sat under that, that teaching, and ultimately we ended up teaching it. But they taught us some very important principles like first-time obedience, right? Simple, but looking back on that, that was the beginning of worship, I think. Um, and just teaching our, our kids that, you know, obedience to the Father ultimately is a reflection of our obedience to, to our Father and surrendering our will. Um, and so, you know, I think those early years of parenting set the foundation for uh, and start molding the heart for, for worship. I mean. We did call one of our daughters that seems to have a very good memory about her childhood <laughs> and asked her um, some of these questions just to see what her response would be. And one thing she said was that it was demonstrated to her. She doesn't remember a lot of specific things that we taught but we demonstrated worship and respect to her. Um, and that was easier for them to do because we were doing it. So, and I love the scripture in Deuteronomy that talks about teaching the statutes to your children when you rise, when you lie down, when you're walking along the path. It's not something you save only for a Sunday. You're doing this all week long. And worshiping your father all week long in nature or whatever you're doing with your children is something that's important, I think. Yeah. Amen. Oh, no, they've got a mic. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to add to that or anything? Uh, yeah, I would just say, um, you know, I think in, in that regard, and it's the same way for a lot of things, that it's, it's caught, not taught. Um, that children are going to watch their parents and do what they do. And so I think that um, modeling that for them um, is so important. You know, Paul gives us great examples throughout the New Testament of just encouraging other believers to follow him. He's like, hey, I'm going to go for it. Come after me, you know. Follow me as I follow Christ. Like when Paul interacts with Timothy, he's like, hey, like, do what I do. Come follow me. We're going to do this together. And I think it's the same thing in regard to worship with our children, like, hey, we're going to do this together, um, follow me. And I, I, I do agree, like, we can spend a lot of time, like Becky said, we can spend a lot of time trying to teach things and, like, help them understand. But at the end, probably when they're 25, 30 years old, they're not going to remember that per se, but they may remember just following along and being with you and seeing you do it and uh, um, knowing that that's how it, how it should be. I, mean, I just know from my own parents, my own experience, it's really cool uh, generationally to, to watch in my own life and just, uh, as I shared a little bit last week, following my own mom and dad uh, in the way that uh, they pursue the Lord. And just the consistency, like faithfulness over time. Uh, it's really important. One thing I was thinking about that you said, and we say in our household too, because from about the time they start having rational thoughts and can say to you, do we have to go to church? Because you'll hear that earlier than you would expect. And I always say, no, we get to go. And they're like, oh. so now they don't even hardly ask because they know if they do, they're like, I know we get to, we get to. But I'm saying it's, it's true, though, because there's other people in other countries that don't get to go freely worship the Lord. And we have that privilege here in America to freely go worship the Lord. And so I think that's really important the way we frame that, like, we have to go now get in the car right now. And not that we've never done that. <laughs> It's happened once or twice, but this month. <laughs> this month. <laughs> um, but just, just setting it up to like say, no, we get to do this. Like it's an honor. We get to worship the Lord. Yeah. And um, I would just say it's something you just have to stay at because every stage is different. Um, and there are different challenges for every stage. But I know... Um, even from our own family, there were few times we didn't go on Sunday if it was really late. But if I mean, we got home really, really late, we might not have. But we also had to stay in and uh, talk together about the Lord. And we weren't allowed to do anything until after church was over. Um, so that's something for our family. We always tell them we don't go out um, Saturday night and stay out too late that we can't get up and go worship the Lord on Sunday morning. And as the kids start getting older and want to go do things with their friends, 
the curfew is set a little bit earlier and we remind them because we're going to get up and go worship in the morning. Um, so if you're not able to do that, then you're not also able to go out on Saturday night. So it's a few times that that's been a little bit of an issue. Not much, though. That's great. You know, and I was reminded, I read this again, and I'm not going to be able to tell you where, uh, but it said, uh, I, I don't just want my child's obedience, I want their heart, right? And so if I've got their obedience, but it's begrudging, and they, they, they hate it, right? I've missed their heart, and so I, we want to be on their level, like it's a get to, and it, there's this joy and excitement, and, and we're emulating that for them, and that they want to follow their parents' example, because they know my father, my mother and father love me. Like they, they really bring me along. So it's convicting. What are some ways uh, you? What are some ways you uh, help train your child to worship? It, so on the Sunday service, especially, maybe um, start here with Jackson and Becky. Some, um, maybe some practical, some how tos. Uh, you can mention, you know, incentives or rewards for sitting through a service when they're little for a certain amount of time or whatever it might look like. Or, hey, you know, training, training them actively while they sit next to you. Um, how did that look? How did that morph over time? Um, you know, when I was thinking about this question this week, I went back to my own childhood. So my mom and dad didn't really go to church, but they made sure my sister and I went to church, so they'd drop us off and pick us up or would ride with, with friends. Uh, but I remember two deacons uh, vividly that stood at the door of the First Baptist Church in DeLeon, Texas. And we'd go to Sunday school, and us boys would get out early and would play around, get all sweaty on the front church lawn. And then when it was time for church, uh, we'd, we'd run to the front door. And those two deacons, if we had our cap on, they would jerk our cap off and shove it in our chest. And they'd tell us, you know, tuck your shirt in. Uh, you know, because you don't come in this place with a cap on or with your shirt tail uh, untucked. And, you know, this is very legalistic. I'm not recommending that. But looking back is like it taught me that there was something different when I stepped into the worship center or the sanctuary that we called it back then. That was a different place, and something was happening there. I didn't understand at the time, but it, it just re adults acted differently there, and there was a different expectation. And I think that was a valuable lesson for me because, again, when we're talking to our daughter, uh, she, she referenced that. She said, you know, she knew that when she came into this place, something different was happening, and it was worship. She did, couldn't, you know, articulate it young, but she knew. And it was the whole, like you said, I mean, Becky did a great job. You know, Saturday baths were important because you had to be really clean for Sunday, right? So the girls would, you know, you always wash your hair, right? And uh, I would always scrub behind Jonathan's ears on Saturday night. I didn't care so much during the week, but Sunday, you had to be cleaner for some reason, right? And, uh, you know, you, that would be, you get the fancy hairdos and stuff. And so they just something special about Sunday morning was where it started. And our daughter told us, she said, you know, I wasn't sure, but, you know, I watched y'all. And she also said this, she said, it was really important. The, the, the takeaway that I remember most was you guys telling us that under no circumstances do you distract other people because they're doing, you know, business well. They're worshiping. And she, that was something she remembered. So, um, you know, just putting others first and, and just that, that teaching. And, you know, we expected first-time obedience. And, I mean, we, we drug took them out many times. Uh, yeah, many times. Many times. In fact, I remember taking Jonathan out one day, and he's going, don't hit me! <laughs> I'm like, they think I beat my child. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, but... You, you drag them out, right? Uh, you, not the hitting part. You can spank, but not the hitting part. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, we were as consistent, I think, in worship as we were at home. You know, there was not a different rule for discipline in church. We expected first-time obedience. If you didn't, we'd go out and talk about it or something else. Usually something else. Um, the only thing I would add to that with being practical is... Whenever you're bringing your four-year-old or your five-year-old in for the first time to sit with you, prepare them and like talk about it ahead of time. Let them know what to expect. And they're always going to ask, at least my kids did, can I sit with my friend 
so-and-so, or can my friend sit with me? Whenever they're just learning how to behave in worship, say no. <laughs> <laughs> say no because you're, you're, you want to prepare them for success. And if they're sitting next to their little friend, it's going to be hard for them to not be distracting and to be quiet and to be reverent. That, that's my only mm -hmm. major takeaway. I think uh, if you look back, as, as we look back, um, the times where we were the most consistent family worship-wise at home, Sundays were easier. Yeah, so the consistency during the week, because you're training the child to, hey, you're going to have to sit still for a little bit, we're going to participate in this together. And so when we were together as a family and we were, you know, we were, you know, doing, doing well at home on consistency-wise, it made Sundays uh, a lot easier. Um, you know, Stephen mentioned uh, the sound of music earlier. And uh, personally, Samuel's a little bit more like Captain Von Trapp, and Carol is more like Maria. And so we just, yeah, we just have different styles. And so, like, for me, like, early on, I was like, hey, we're putting the kids in the nursery, man. We ain't doing all this noise. Like, they're gonna squirming around, all that. And Carol, like, from jump was like, so we had our kids, Travis Avenue Baptist Church, Fort Worth, Texas. Like, the girls were with us, like, from jump. From birth. From birth. We were in the back, though. Yeah, in the back. Very back. And so that was just a, convictionally for her, I mean, it was a really strong, like, she really wanted um, to have the girls with us and train them. And, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this together. I mean, and so... Um, it was harder for me because I'm a little bit more, you know, like I want the box square, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just my style, okay? Like, where's the whistle? Everyone line up. Let's, <laughs> let's rock this deal, you know? Um, but uh, God's been refining me through that process. Um, but I think just consistency over time. Uh, it's like, uh, remember the Titans, Coach Boone says, he looks at his playbook, the other guy looks at his playbook and goes, man, you don't have any plays. And he's like straight veer, it's like Novocaine, just give it time. And so, like, parenting in the pew or having your kid in the church um, is about just consistency over time, right? Just being faithful over time, faithful in little, master over much, like, just consistently over time uh, walking them through that process. And I think just faithfulness during the week bears fruit on the weekend, um, if I could kind of give you, like, a little quip uh, for that. And also just um, what you were talking about, preparation, um, don't expect you know, a two, three, four, five-year-old to act like a 35-year-old because they won't. Um, so we had lots of uh, crayons. We had a whole tote bag full of crayons with three or four different coloring books. And of course, they're all Bible ones. They have plenty of those. Um, and they want to bring their Elsa on. I'm like, oh, no, we're not doing Elsa today. We're doing Jesus. <laughs> and so... <laughs> That, that helps them to know, like, not that you can't ever do Elsa, but this is a special place, and this is a place where we go talk about um, the Father, and we talk about Jesus and stories, you know, his stories, and so we have that prepared and ready for them. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to act perfectly, that you, you step outside as often as you need to, um, but I think that helped them to kind of navigate that time period. Yeah. I yeah. think the way that we, I think, I think the way it's done Southside is, is helpful. I, I think sometimes the little, little ones are hard. We were in uh, with the one-year-olds last week. It was awesome, by the way. If you don't get to serve in the nursery at all, like you should, it's amazing. Um, but uh, it, it's hard for the little, little ones to do it. Um, but I think when they hit five, you know, there needs to be a little rise up, and, uh, you know, they can, they can do it. So, like, if they're going to go to school and have to sit in school a little bit, they ought to be able to sit and listen and uh, glean um, and, you know, listen to the sermon and maybe write some things down and draw a little bit, you know, it's just uh, right expectations, I think, are important. Um, and then I'll say this, too. I think the hardest part about discipling and disciplining your children is disciplining yourself, okay, as a parent. Because it's just easy just to kind of like, oh, it's not a big deal, or oh, I don't want to do this. Just really disciplining yourself, I think, is the most difficult thing when you're talking about worship, parenting, all those things. Yeah, amen. And those are good insights. And I, I'm not going to get to all these questions for y'all, so that's good. Y'all are off the hook. Because y'all even touched on the ones ahead of time. Y'all were thinking about them. This kind of wove its way in. Uh, so what I want to leave y'all with, and we'll have some time for some Q&A. 
Um, uh, so if you have a question, maybe a specific, maybe something you're dealing with, we can maybe shed some light on it. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll mention, too, is everything is done intentionally in, in the walls of this church. I hope you see that. I know sometimes it can feel like, you know, why did they do it that way? You know, and there's, there's different differencing of opinions, but we try to be really intentional with how we welcome the congregation into the church, and especially children. And so from, like I said, giving the songs out ahead of time to, so that you can know them as a family and come in ready to worship God through the singing, uh, reading the passage ahead of time, Preaching expositionally helps build routine in your family so that you know the verse typically, uh, what's coming next, and so that you can say, oh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be in this passage of Scripture. You can read it to your family, and your kids can be thinking about that. We have children's sermon notes available for parents with kids, and so they can write down the title of the sermon, the, is it New Testament, Old Testament, words I didn't know, words I did know, and it's a way for you as a parent to engage them on that level. They can have carry some interest through the sermon, um, and then uh, you know, talk, a bit, talk with it after, um, talk about it after the, the service. And so everything's done with some intentionality, and it's for the strengthening of families as they worship together. And everybody's different, and so if you struggle with bringing your kids in, uh, the, the five-year-old, four-year-old, I know right now we asked four-year-olds to come in, and that was a hangover from COVID when the nursery was at its low, 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 and we were trying to build up. Um, but, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about, you know, how the nursery is going to play a role to help you and not hinder you um, with being more intentional in nursery and things like that. But uh, I want to, uh, I just want to commend y'all. C- keep doing it. Keep fighting the good fight. I know y'all are with us and you're there and uh, the kids can sometimes pull on your, your strings, on your nerves, uh, but keep being consistent. Like Samuel said, be disciplined in your own heart and uh, your kids will, will follow you know, they, they will. So I want to open it up to y'all. I'm going to have, um, I'm going to have one mic ran by Cougar. We telepathically communicated there. And uh, if you have a question, yeah, we got Jared up here. Beltran. He's in, he's in training. Uh, Jared Beltran. I just had a question. So you keep mentioning this family worship. And just for some of us who might not know what that means, yeah. could y'all explain what that is, what that looks like, how that's done practically? I mean, I don't mind starting that one, but I want, I want y'all's input. Family worship is simply um, time that you section off as a family. Um, you know, in, in the Puritan <laughs> uh, days, it was morning, lunch, and evening. And so it was three times a day. Uh, I've, I've said people, you know, they, some people say you need twice a day. Really, we want you to be engaging with the Word, the Word of God, as a family. So open up the Scriptures. A father lead their kids and their family in a reading of the Word to pray together as a family and to sing. Sing one song or two songs. Gather around a piano or a guitar or a YouTube video or whatever it is and sing worship to God. And so it really is what those three things. Read, pray, sing. And you're doing that not, it doesn't have to be every day in order to be successful, but it needs to be consistent and a routine, something that the kids are looking forward to. That's what, that's basically what it is. And uh, it's a lost art. It's a lost, it's a neglected grace, but we need to recover that. We're trying. So, any other things to add? Family worship? What it is? How it's done? It's a good question. Me, Cohen. Ronnie Come on, Cohen. Ronnie. Um, as a first generational Christian, um, when I came uh, to Christ as 30, at 33, and then we were raising my son, and looking back, um, it's one of those things you can say, I, you did the best. I did the best that I can based on what I knew because I was learning how to be a Christian and trying to learn how to do the family worship and all that kind of stuff. And now, confessionally, you know, I have a son that's not following the Lord right now. So as a, if there's any first generational Christians in here that didn't have the parents and the grandparents and the great grandparents and everybody that was discipling you through life, what encouragement can you give them as they're coming to Christ and trying to raise their children to follow the Lord also? I think I can speak to that just a little bit from my dad's perspective. My dad was a first generation Christian. He came to Christ uh, at 17. No one in his family was a believer. Uh, I think it would, it would just be, man, just be a sponge, right? As much as you can take in, right? Um, take in. And 
want to grow yourself, and then realize that you're going to do it imperfectly, right? And even people who generationally have been poured into, right, um, they're going to they're going to do it imperfectly as well. And so, operating from a place of grace and being like, hey, I'm not going to I'm not going to get it all right. I'm going to make mistakes, and I can learn from those mistakes. And I think uh, being willing to go back, and my dad was a great example of that to me, of just being able to apologizing or saying, hey. We didn't do this right. We wish we'd have done this differently. Um, and so I, I think just being a sponge, trying to gather information and, you know, just operating from a place of grace that I'm not going to hit it every time and, you know, um, looking for little things. I think also just meeting with other believers. And um, I see Dan Flat sitting here, and so he's a really great example to me. Um, they have people in their home all the time, and the good, the bad, the ugly, they see everything. And they, um, I know a lot of college students have commented to me, we really appreciate seeing them doing family worship together. And it's not always uh, beautiful and um, organized, but it's intentional and consistent. And so if you can get around other believers that are trying to worship the Lord, um, then I think it's very helpful to, to see that happen and also see that it's not always perfect and that it is messy and that it gets interrupted and that the enemy definitely wants to interrupt that time and just expect that. Um, but, but being with other believers, I think, is super helpful. Yeah, discipleship. Good. Any other questions? You got one? Oh, Randy, come on. So y'all talk a lot about the men's role, father's role in leading the home, but the wives and mothers that are at home all the time when the fathers and husbands are not home all the time, can you just speak into that role? I'll start and then Becky will probably have something to chime in on, but um, when, when it comes to family worship, there's was always a song in our house, if you know my wife, uh, you know, singing constantly and it was usually uh the bible verse you know songs uh they were in our purple plymouth van all the time anytime we're on a road trip uh we had those <laughs> songs playing uh, we probably got them on cassette still somewhere in, yeah, in the closet <laughs> um but yeah that m mom and, and worship w was huge in in our home um and then she was just so uh, great to point out uh, because I was gone a lot. I traveled as well, but uh, you know, just the Deuteronomy six um, method. You know, um, pointing out creation and, and God's hand in creation everywhere. Uh, you know, taking everything to prayer. Uh, friends having problems, we would pray about it. Uh, you know, bad grades, we would pray about it. Just recognizing God's sovereignty in our home. And Becky would just anchored our family that way, night and day. But you're very kind. Um, I will say that it was best for us. Of course, consistency is the best thing you can do. And it was best for me to not postpone any punishment till their father came home. It was better to just go ahead and take care of it at the moment, which is sometimes hard because moms have it, but it's, it would also be hard if... I always postponed it and gave it to him. But consistency, like Samuel said, is the best thing. So if you're, if mom at home, you're the one that's doing it, just be consistent in what you're doing. And a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, especially once you have teenagers. You think it's hard with the toddlers and the, man, it's going to get worse. <laughs> I don't want to discourage you in that, but it is going to get worse. But with teenagers, the one prayer that we always prayed is that their sins would be found out, that they would not be able to keep anything hidden. And whenever you pray that, you have to be ready yourself for those things that come up that are hard for the parents to go, oh, I can't believe my kid did that. So be prepared for that, but pray that their sins would be found out. And encourage you, Mom, because it is hard whenever Dad's gone a lot, but just be as consistent as you can all the time. I, am, I have trouble uh, staying on routine or on schedule. And so I... Uh, 
I know that y'all probably don't know that. But I do have uh, consistent routines, and I have to schedule like our day out, especially because we were homeschooling and still homeschool Mariah. And it looks so different than how he would do it. Um, but we keep Whistle. usually, <laughs> there's still natural rhythms to the day and natural flow. And so even when they're really young, um, now whether it's exactly 9 a.m., y'all know for me it wasn't. But it was nap time around 9 or 10-ish, you know. But they were, I knew that the, they had a consistent rhythm. And so um, one thing that I would talk to Samuel about is, well, God knew I was the one going to be home with them and not you and my personality with theirs. And, and then I just pray and tell the Lord that, like, you knew I was going to be the one. Um, and so talking to the Lord all throughout the day and, and your kids seeing that, too, I think is really helpful for you. Um, and that seeing that, that you're on the same page with your husband. And that's hard um, because when he comes home and things look different than how it would have been if he was there, um, it creates challenges. But they also see us work through that together. Um, but I would just say just trying to create a rhythm. And I'm not sure if you're super regimented. And my mom friends that were, I learned a lot from. And I praise God for them. Um, but they also said that they appreciated my spontaneity and being able to pick up and go and not worry about the schedule. But if somebody needed something or called, that we could take care of that. Um, and so I think there, there's a natural rhythm that has to be there um, and try to stay consistent with that. Amen. Praise God. Um, one thing that I'll mention is the command for children, Exodus 20, right, is honor your father and your mother. And in Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents. So obviously, our kids have that responsibility to obey father and mother. Naturally, in a parent relationship, they both can't lead equally. There's going to be a leader. One person's going to lead out. And it should be the father in, in a lot of ways, but the mother's going to be the one spending a lot of the time. And it's a, it's a partnership, like y'all talked about. And there's a, there's, a, there's a learning that happens, but it's a, you're together, and you're Children need to obey you as parents, father and mother, and not, uh, not just the father, you know. And yeah, so praise God for that. We're going to be, I think that's it. Um, unless there's a burning question, we just can't hold back. We'll go a little long, but uh, I think we're going to shut it down. Mm -hmm.